Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining me. Um, let's just see if I can shrink that. That's not it's a lot bigger than I anticipated. Sorry. Um, so, good morning. Thank you for joining me for this funding and policy update this morning. Um, we'll start in a moment. I'm just waiting. There's still people joining. I can see the numbers going up quite quickly. So I'll wait a, another 30 seconds or so before we actually get into the actual webinar. Um, I won't keep my camera on because it takes up bandwidth um, and, um, and, and makes it more difficult for, the, um, for things like sound to function effectively. So good morning. Thank you for joining me, everybody. It's just a quick hello from me. Um, and now I'll turn the camera off and um, you'll just be able to see the slides, hopefully. So, right, so whilst we're still people joining, um, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I'm not expecting any fire alarms or anything today because I am actually working from home, as I'm sure many of us are. Um, just a bit of housekeeping with regards to GoToWebinar. I'm sure, um, considering the last year and a half, that many, many of you have used Goto or Zoom many times whilst accessing webinars and various events. Um, but for the, just in case there are, there are people that haven't, in the top right-hand corner of your screen, you should see a little red arrow. If you click that, the um, control panel for GoToWebinar will pop out and you'll be able to see a variety of different functions um, just so that you're all aware, you are all muted for this webinar. Um, so I won't be able to hear you, but you should be able to hear me. What would be great is if someone could just click in chat or questions um, and make it um, just indicate that you can actually hear me and there's no problem with sound at all. Um, so that would be great. And then I know that it's working. So that little red arrow gives you access to a variety of functions, including the questions. I'll be answering questions towards the end. So please do put your questions in the questions section and then I'll work my way through them um, before we actually click off today and finish the webinar. Um, so as I said, you'll all be in mute function. So I won't be able to hear you, but you should be able to hear me. Um, and to get rid of um, that um, control panel, if you don't want, to in want it to interfere with what you can see on the slides, click on the red, little red arrow and it will, put the it will close the control panel, although you'll still have access to the buttons to open and close it as you need. Um, so let's just have a, a look and see. Yes, you can hear me. That's great. So thank you, Luke. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Louise. Brilliant. So obviously sound is great. Um, we're now... Um, getting towards almost 200 people on the um, session. So I think I'm going to start. Um, so this is one of three funding and policy updates that I do annually for all of our customers um, and employers um, and partners um, to support you um, with information about what's going on currently with funding um, and policy and what we can see potentially coming down the line. Um, there's an awful lot going on at the moment um, and we're also quite delayed um, with a variety of different information that particularly providers you would have expected to see and have access to by now from the ESFA for example um, the apprenticeship funding rules for 2021-22 have still not been published and we are still waiting for those to come out um, and there are some issues around the adult skills offer as well. Um, we've had a lot of queries from a lot of providers um, and employers about the adult skills offer. So I will talk about that in a moment. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping. I'm not expecting any um, fire alarms because, as I said, I'm working from home, as I'm sure many of you are. The only thing I am expecting today is the delivery of a parcel. So I really apologise if my doorbell goes off in the middle of this webinar because that's bound to be either the Royal Mail um, or Amazon delivering something. So um, so I do apologise for that if that if that noise starts. So without any further ado, I'm actually going to move on to the agenda for the day so you can see what we're going to be looking at. So adult skills, adult education budget. Um, you'll notice that I'm now talking about adult skills rather than just it used to be that mostly what we talked about was the adult education budget and the funding and policy attached to the AEB. But more and more over the course of the last year, we're talking about adult skills because it's not just about the adult education budget anymore. It is about a lot of other initiatives that the government has put in place to support 19 plus learners. So I'll be covering all of them during today's session. Um, we'll look a little bit at Restart because that's about to get off the ground um, as from July. So um, for those of you that know about it and already are involved and are potentially either subcontracting or partnering with one of the primes, 
Um, I won't spend too much time on that, but for those of you that are not aware um, and want to know more, I'll give a very quick overview of Restart, where it is, what it entails, and also potentially how you can get involved. Then we'll look at the developments in traineeships and what's happening there, both now and also going forward, because um, I can see a bit further down the road with traineeships and what's going to be occurring over the next few years, and I just think it's worth having a quick discussion about that. Um, I'll tell you what I do know about the apprenticeships funding and policy, um, although as I said the funding rules are not out yet for next year so we're still waiting for them so I can't go into a massive amount of detail um, but there is information to be to be um, flagged. Um, I'll also talk about the new subcontracting new policy and rules for this year and going forward because the um, subcontracting funding rules for 2021-22 have been published. I'm not going to go into massive detail as I'm still looking at the potential of running a um, subcontracting um, workshop. Um, so I'll do an overview of where we are with those subcontracting and what the direction of travel is um, and then we'll have a QA and a um, for any questions that we may ask. So, on to the first section. Oh, don't do that to me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, we actually, City and Guilds actually carried out some adult skills research last year because we could see with everything that the government was talking about and all the noise around adult skills and the need for retraining um, um, that there was a need to look at what was actually really going on with 19 plus learners. And when I talk about 19 plus learners, I'm not just talking about 19 to 24. I'm talking about the whole range of, of um, adult skills right up to people who are, you know, uh, in their 50s. Um, and, and those heading towards retirement. Um, we, what we wanted to know was what do adults really want and in terms of the type of training they might be looking to access, how they might access it, and what they knew about what was out there. Um, now this report has been published and you can see the link down there to our new adult skills page and the link to the full report is there, but I just thought it was worth pulling out a few of the stats, um, we interviewed over a thousand people um, for this research to get feedback from a whole variety um, of age ranges um, and from people right across the country. And some surprising figures came out um, and it's really prompted us as an, as an organisation, as, as an awarding organisation, to look at what we do um, and also look at the type of, um, of products that we produce um, that to support the, the adult population. But the, a few of the stats you can see. So um, that first two stats on the left hand side in blue, you can see basically um, adults are looking for part time flexible access to, to fit around other commitments. So if they're, if they're employed or even if they're not employed, because they may have other commitments such as childcare or care or, or any other type of commitment that, you know, that hits you as, as, as you become, as, as you become a, a working adult. 52% um, of them said they wanted access to a, a much more flexible arrangement for learning and upskilling or changing their skill set to enable them to remain employed um, and remain re for their for, you know their skills to remain relevant in today's employment market. So 52% wanted part-time and flexible access, and by flexible access they meant you know access that was either evening um, or could potentially be carried out online. Um, also, 44% of those interviewed said that they want, would want funding to cover the full cost or at least some of the partial costs of the course. Um, so some of, the, some of the government commitments that have been made in the last year um, with regards to adult skills are really going to help those that are looking for funding to cover their courses. So out of out of that over a thousand people that we interviewed, almost 50 percent of them wanted um, access to funding to cover the cost of the course. So National Skills Fund Adult Level 3, um, that's going to hopefully help some of those adults that are looking for funding because they can't afford to pay for it themselves. Um, now, the middle section, um, we talked to both unemployed and employed people. Um, and of those that are employed, there's still quite a high proportion, 30% of them, that couldn't afford to pay for the cost of a training course. So again, some of that funding flexibility that the government's, and I know it's not as flexible as we would like to see, um, certainly not as flexible uh, as I think is going to be needed going forward if we are really going to upskill the adult workforce um, to make sure that their work skills remain relevant and they can remain employed or, or you know, in increase their career opportunities and progression opportunities. But of those that we interviewed, 30% still couldn't afford to pay for a training course. So that extra funding that's been pumped in should help that. 
And of course, those that are unemployed, 59, almost 60% of those people um, who are unemployed could not afford to pay for a training course. Um, the great thing to think about um, um, the adult skills section is up to 24. Um, the access to um, various courses is nearly all fully funded. So um, that's that's a bonus. And I've got a grid later on which shows that. Um, and then over on the far right hand side, um, what we also found is that there are a lot of students and learners and adults over the, out there that really do not know what is available to, available to them course wise. They don't know how to access funding. They don't know what courses are available. Um, they don't know if they're eligible for those courses. So there's a lot of lack of awareness, I think, amongst the adult population of what they can actually get access to. Um, so I mean, we're looking at that as an awarding body, but as providers, getting your, you know, your, 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 um, offer out there um, and trying to find ways of reaching the adult population, I think is going to be really key going forward if we're really going to have an effect on the skills of that population and also use effectively the funding that the government has now put into that area. And as I said earlier, I know, you know, the eligibility criteria for the National Skills Fund and also, the, the, you know, the the courses offered under the National Skills Fund are probably not as broad as we would like to see. Um, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later because we've just had um, had some news which which is uh, a positive for that. Um, but it, the offer is there, and it, the, you know the more it can be used, the better it's going to be for for the 19 plus population in terms of skills and, and career opportunities, particularly um, you know after the the pandemic and and the economic situation that we're currently in. Um, and that need for people to retrain into other sectors um, and, and some of them really wanting to retrain into other sectors because they don't feel that their current sector is going to offer them the opportunity or is a, a safe enough option for them going forward to remain employed on an ongoing basis. So that's some of that adult skills research and you can get access to this, you can get access to um, that on our new adult skills site. Um, so we've set up a new um, adult skills site. I did have a, an adult education budget funding page that is still there, but we are increasingly um, replacing it with this new site, which has got a lot more information about the various different adult skills options for, for retraining and funding. So it links to all the information on adult skills, to the adult education budget, to traineeships, to restart and also to apprenticeships, all of which are available to adults. So, um, and it's also got links to our, um, as, as I said, links to that research um, that we've got there. It will also have, when I get to produce it, um, links to our funded course directory. Now that's the directory that I produce annually, which shows all of the courses that um, if City and Guilds has funded from, for public funding by the ESFA um, and streams them into the different funding programs. So 16 to 19 loans, AEB, uh, we'll also have a National Skills Fund offer in there this year, the ESF funded offer. So it streams it and you can also then filter it because it's a large spreadsheet by level, by sector subject area, by guided learning hours, by funding stream, in whatever way you want to, to help you plan your curriculum for next year. So once I've produced the funded course directory, and I'm sorry, it's not up there now, but there's a good reason for that, and I'll get to that in a moment, um, that the link for that will also go up on this page and you'll be able to download that course directory or access that course directory from this new adult skills site. Um, so that's the link to it there at the bottom um, if you want to go and have a look at that web page after the webinar um, and get a view for, for, for what we'll be putting up on there. There's a lot of information already but there's more information to be added to it because um, we're still growing that new part of the website um, as, as new information becomes available. So as I said earlier, we are looking at an increasingly complex and changing landscape for adult skills. We've got the Skills Bill and the second reading of the Skills Bill went through Parliament a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment because there's some interesting and potentially quite challenging um, aspects of that part of the Skills Bill, which was discussed in Parliament and in the Lords um, that you need to be aware of and prepared for potentially. Um, so we've got still got the adult education budget, but that's now really sort of almost split into three strands. You've got the devolved budget, which goes to the um, mayoral combined authorities, the MCAs. Um, you've got the procured aspect of the adult education budget, which is mainly for independent training providers, and we are still waiting for the outcome for that. It was meant to come out last week. I don't yet think it's been published. It may well be that independent training providers have actually had news of that in the last 24 hours, but if they have, it hasn't been published, so we don't know about that yet. 
And then, of course, there's the grant funded, which is for local authorities and, and further education colleges. Um, and they already know what their, their allocations are for next year. Um, but the, those that both of those independent training providers and other bodies that um, uh, applied to the commercial process for adult education budget, as far as we know, you're still waiting for the outcome, which is getting pretty close to the bone um, for the deadline of, you know, getting that organised and having your curriculum organised for next year and, and being ready for delivery. Um, so I really hope for your sake and, and ours and everybody else's that that's, that's published pretty soon and that you, you, you've then got some, some time, probably not enough, but some time to actually plan your curriculum for next year. Um, then we have the National Skills Fund offer, the Adult Level 3. Um, now, I said I'd mentioned something about that. We actually appealed um, for a batch of qualifications to be added to the National Skills Fund because um, we felt that there were some that should be on there that were missing. Um, and we've had news in the last couple of days that another 14 or 15 qualifications that we've appeared will be added to the National Skills Fund. I don't know when they are going to show on that spreadsheet that the ESFA has put up on the site that tells you which qualifications are in the National Skills Fund, but certainly I will be off, um, adding them to our funded course um, directory offer um, once I've got access to that. Um, so that will be in the funded course directory as well. Um, but hopefully those additional 14 or 15 qualifications and they're in sectors such as horticulture, construction. Um, we've got two or three IT um, user and practitioner qualifications in there, which is a real bonus because they weren't in there before. And I really think they should have been because um, we know that um, employers are asking for them. Um, so they've all been added in there. So horticulture, um, um, IT and construction. Um, there's some extra qualifications being added into that there, which is great. Um, and then we've got adult advanced learner loans. We know that's still in place for the next couple of years, but with the skills bill, we know that that FE advanced learner loan offer is going to be replaced sometime around 2025 um, with the new um, um, loan, um, lifetime skills guarantee loan, which will be for HE and FE, which the government is looking at as part of the skills bill. Um, they did say they were going to consult on that. We haven't seen any further consultation. I think if there's going to be anything, it's probably going to be next year now. Um, but as I said, that new reading of the skills bill went through Parliament, um, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, 19 to 4 traineeships, um, the um, allocations for the procured 19 to 24 traineeships were um, published earlier on this year, so all of the providers know um, who have got, um, will we'll know if they've got funding for that for next year. Um, then you've got adult apprenticeships, you've got Restart, which I'll go to later, and you've got boot camps, which for adults, and also the sector-based work programme, which, which includes 19 to 24, um, 16 to 24 offer, so it does include some adult provision. Um, so the skills bill, um, yes, so that went through Parliament, um, or the second reading was, was, was went through the Commons a couple of weeks ago and then has now gone to the, the Lords. A lot of questions were asked about it. Um, now there's a couple of um, issues with that that I think you should be aware of. Um, you should know by now, and if you don't, the, hopefully this, this is, um, you do know, but if you don't, the, the register of, of training organisations. Now that's the register which is for organisations not delivering apprenticeships. You may deliver apprenticeships but if you are doing so you will be on the ROTAT, the Register of Apprenticeship Training Organisations. But the ESFA has also had another register for training organisations that deliver um, AEB and, and loans um, and various other um, contracted funded um, um, provision. So ROTO is being decommissioned and as from the end of this year, end of July, it will no longer be in place. So the skills bill proposes a new provider list to replace ROTO. It's not going to be in place when ROTO is decommissioned. So for the moment, we will be without a register. Obviously, the ESFA has, has a database of all the um, providers that they have contracts with. But there is within the skills bill, there is, is, is a note saying that they are looking at a new provider list to replace ROTO with a potential registration fee, as if you don't have enough costs attached to what you do already. Um, now, there's no information there about what that registration fee might be or how high it might be. Um, obviously, this is this is a way for, for the government to, and the ESFA to raise money. Um, but also part of that, um, that, um, that new provider um, registration list would also be indemnity insurance against closure costs. Now, this is, I think, in response to the fact that in the last couple of years, quite a few providers have closed at very short notice and left 
learners without any provision um, and any support and so the ESFA has had to step in um, and obviously try and find places for those learners to be um, moved to and other providers to pick them up and as part of that in some cases they've found that funding has been claimed for um, those learners and that learner provision but actually the learner may not be as far along in their course um, the, or their program that they're taking as the funding would you would as, as the funding um, to, to match with the funding so there's been disparities in terms of learner progression and the amount of funding claimed against the progression and that has left some providers that have had learners trans transferred over short of funding because they've looked at that you know once they've received the learner um, file they've realized that there's an awful lot more to do but there's actually not a lot of funding left to do it with and so the ESFA has sometimes had to step in um, and bail out that aspect of um, 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 the outcome of a provider closure as well. So I think the indemnity insurance is against those closure costs to make sure that providers are covered um, and that the ESFA is covered to, to deal with some of that. Now, that indemnity insurance um, is an interesting one in the skills bill. It's certainly worth reading up about if you are a private provider um, uh, and you think that you would obviously, well, you would need to be on that new provider list. Um, the new provider list, from what we, from what I can see, looks very much like it's going to be for those providers that have contracts of one hundred thousand pounds or more with the ESFA, um, uh, or potentially maybe five hundred thousand pounds or more. That they're looking at a sort of threshold for for entry to that um, that list and the registration fee for entering that list. Um, now, what that means for smaller providers who deliver underneath that threshold, uh, that's another big question. We don't really know the answer to that yet um, and how that would work. So that's definitely one to watch with that skills bill along with that indemnity insurance because that's going to mean extra costs um, for independent training providers going forward once, once that skills bill goes through. Um, and if that if that aspect of the skills bill um, is st stays and, and passes through Parliament, now the skills bill still has at least another eight or nine months to go before it finally uh, is goes through and is passed because it will go backwards and forwards between the, the Commons and the Lords with various questions and challenges for various aspects of it. So it's very unlikely that any of this is really going to come into play. Um, probably 2022, 23, it's probably not even going to be in play then, or so, although some aspects of it might begin to, to appear in 2022, 23. But I think it's more likely that most of the skill, skills bill, um, the, the, the plan for jobs skills bill, um, is, is looking at sort of, I suppose, introduction in probably 23, 24. So we've still got a couple of years, but you might see parts of it beginning to pop into, um, you know, into um, the way that we we work as a, as a as a sector, potentially in 22, 23. But it will very much depend on the speed at which it goes through Parliament, um, and how many questions and challenges um, it faces as as it goes backwards and forwards between the Lords and um, between the Lords and the Commons. Um, so. No news on the funding reform consultation. So as you, some of you will know, there was a level three um, consultation last year. And then earlier on this year, there was a, a level two call for evidence. The um, we I have heard that it's potentially the level three uh, consultation. That's the level three qualification consultation. We may get an outcome and respond to that before um, parliamentary recess, which happens in uh, mid-July. So we some, might get something before mid-July. If not, then obviously it'll wait until parliament comes back after the summer, summer break. Um, the call for evidence for level two and below, I don't think we will see anything from that um, in terms of a response until probably autumn time. Um, so um, next year, next academic year, um, um, and, and potentially, as I say, early autumn, maybe even late autumn. Um, but we are beginning to see the effect of, of some of those skills reforms already um, on the adult skills offer, and I'll talk about that later on. Um, so, well, I can talk about it now, actually, the level two and level three legal entitlement. So we've had a lot of queries from a lot of providers who have had some big concerns about the fact that when they go on to LARS or the new learning aim service, um, they are seeing a lot of the legal um, le legal entitlement for level two and level three has not yet been rolled over and it shows as funded for the, for the next academic year. Um, now, this is not the fault of the ESFA. Ministers have been taking a very keen interest in the legal entitlement for level two and level three. 
um, and they've been looking at that list of qualifications and they have not signed it off or they had not signed it off and the ESFA cannot do any update on Lars or actually it won't be Lars because Lars is being decommissioned um, in the next months and so will no longer be available but the new learning aim service um, or find a learning aim service um, there are a lot of qualifications on there at the moment that do not show as funded for 2022 2021-22 um, that is coming, don't worry. I know it's hugely delayed and for those of you that are trying to plan your adult curriculum for next year, this is a real challenge. Um, I recognise that and I'm, I'm, you've got all my sympathy on that one. There's nothing we can do and there's nothing the ESFA can do. They are hoping that in the next couple of weeks that information will be there on the Find a Learning Aim and you'll then be able to get on with planning your adult offer for next year when normally you'd be planning this in sort of springtime around about March, April, May. So it is very very, very delayed. Um, and that I know is going to be a real challenge for um, for you all in terms of getting ready for next year and what you're going to be offering. Um, so don't worry, it is coming. Um, so if you look on a learning, find a learning aim and you see that um, some of your level two and level three qualifications are not rolled over for next year, hang on, give it a couple of weeks um, and go back and have another look and hopefully it will show. As soon as that level two, level three legal entitlement is fully rolled over, I will then produce the course directory that, uh, that um, we produce annually, which goes up on our website, which um, you can then use as a planning tool um, for your adult curriculum. Um, I've got part of it done for the 16, um, 16 to 19 offer and loans, etc. But the legal entitlement, I, I can't do until the ESFA has done their work because we need to check our um, offer against what the ESFA is, is showing on Find a Learning Aim. So sorry about that delay and sorry about the delay on the course directory, but not much we can do about that. Um, and some other news that came out a couple of weeks ago with regards to um, qualification assessment, uh, qualification achievement rates. Um, so what the ESFA said is that any quals are assessed by teacher assessed grades, by TAGs, will not be included um, for 2021, 2020, 2021 um, qualification achievement rates. And also the, the qualification achievement rates won't be published, but they will be shared with providers privately by the ESFA. So you'll see um, those that have been assessed by TAGS, you'll get to see what the outcome is, but it's not going to be published by the ESFA, but the ESFA will share that information with you so you can see what's going on and you, you can then use that obviously for planning, um, you know, in terms of getting ready for um, inspection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whether um, Ofsted will be looking at um, the unpublished rates, I suppose if they're unpublished, Ofsted probably won't. Um, but it's um, we'll find out about that. Hopefully um, um, it, it'll be a no because they're not published. So um, so that won't be included in the Ofsted inspection process. So the AAB funding rules have been published. Whoopee! Um, there are some changes in there that you need to be aware of. So just quickly to whiz through these, um, there are obviously residency and eligibility changes to reflect that reflect the new Brexit requirements. So do make sure that you read that aspect of the new funding rules for the next academic year um, because they have been updated um, and there there will be new requirements um, reflecting the Brexit. Um, issue. So um, just be aware of those and make sure that you're up to speed and, and that your staff are up to speed with regard with requir um, residency and eligibility requirements. Um, the ESFA have updated the prior learning section. There was actually very little about prior learning in the adult education budget funding rules, barely anything at all. Um, in previous iterations, but in this um, iteration, the 21-22, there is now a proper prior learning section included in the adult education budget funding rules. So you must have a prior learning policy is what it says. Um, you must take note of awarding organisation prior learning requirements relating to individual qualifications. So do contact us if you have any concerns about that. Um, and when it says you must have a prior learning policy, what it's basically saying is very much similar to apprenticeships is you must take account of prior learning. You must not repeat learning um, where it's not necessary to do so with a particular learner. So do make sure you read that section of um, prior learning policy. That's a new section within the funding rules as well. Um, but it also states that you mustn't reduce funding for English and maths up to level two as part of prior learning. So if you are delivering English and maths up to level two, even if the learner has some English and math knowledge um, that, that, that the funding is not reduced for, for functional skills um, um, or, or any other type of English and math qualification up to level two. So that's not affected by prior learning, but everything else is. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, the ROTO is being formally decommissioned on 31st of July, um, so that's no longer going to be there, so you won't have to reapply to ROTO because that's been there's been occasional requests for reapplication, but there may well be a new register with a registration fee coming down the line, that's that skills bill um, issue that I mentioned in the previous slides. Um, subcontracting reforms, um, they are there, but I've got a specific slide about that later on, so we'll touch on that in a little bit more detail later, detail later on. And there have been changes to the unemployed learners' earning thresholds, and they've been updated, as you can see there. So um, for sole learners, it's 345, and for those on joint benefit claims, it's 552. So those are new thresholds. Please be aware of them and have a look at that section. Um, and also, um, there's an expansion of the new flexibilities for traineeships, um, which has been continued throughout 21-22, but I've got more information about that later on in the deck and later on in the webinar. So, qualification forms and ILR changes. Um, I'm flagging this. Um, I'm I, we not, I normally get some MIS um, leads um, webinars, so this is just for you to be aware of. Um, Obviously, the qualification reforms for, for level three and below are ongoing, and we've had those consultations, but it is already beginning to affect some of the offer. Um, and certainly some of the certainly devolution is now beginning to affect the offer in terms of what you might look for on your ILR. Um, so the the ESFA will remove some quals from the funded offer um, for 21-22. Um, mainly the qualifications that are being removed are those that had no registrations. So occasionally we do get providers who come through to us and say, well, this was, a, this was, a, it was funded last year and we weren't delivering it, but we're thinking about delivering it this year, but it doesn't seem to be funded. If a qualification has had no uh, or very low um, registrations on it in the last few years, the ESFA will more than likely be removing it. It will not be funded next year. Um, so you will see if you're going in and you were considering some of those qualifications that there are some that are funded for this year, but they're not funded for next year. But most of the legal entitlement for level two and level three should be available and funded. Um, but there are also some category codes um, to be aware of because there are certain qualifications that are funded by the MCAs, the Mayoral Combined Authorities, um, who have got devolved AEB, that are not funded via the, ESA, the ESFA offer. So in some cases, if you're if you're um, delivering AEB adult education budget in a devolved region, you may have you will potentially have access to more qualifications funded via your MCA, plus the AEB offer that the ESFA has, unless of course there are any constraints um, applied via the MCA, because some MCAs have have, have required have requirements in their contracts for providers just to deliver in certain sectors or to deliver higher numbers in certain sectors. But there are some qualifications that are funded by the MCAs that are not included in the AEB offer. Um, so there's cat so, so that category code 41, that bottom one you can see there, as it says, many of the MCAs have requested additional qualifications to be added or reactivated. So in some cases, it may be qualifications that the ESA has removed and are no longer funding, but they've been reactivated and can be delivered in that MCA area. But it's only in certain MCA areas and it's linked to postcodes. So category code 41 is for devolved areas. It's got to be linked to a particular postcode because it may be that some NCAs have not requested it, but others have. So that does complicate your ILR issue. Um, and the source of funding is via that MCA only. It's not obviously the national AEB that the ESFA still handles. And then you've got a new category code 48 for the National Skills Fund, level three entitlement. Um, now, just to be aware, um, there are some qualifications that are funded via the National Skills Funding, the level, the, that's the adult level three offer for next year, or that, that came into play on the 1st of April, but they might, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are also funded as part of the other, other adult skills entitlements, A, B or loans. So in some cases, you've got some qualifications in the National Skills Fund Adult Level 3 that are not funded for anything else at all, only via that offer. So do check your category codes and be very careful about which ones you're using. There's also a category code with the National Skills Fund that is attached to the size. And I covered that in the last webinar that I did earlier on this year, if you want to go back and check that, um, because there are some parts of the National Skills Fund that have got lower um, guided learning hours and you don't get and you get a lower uplift. And then there are some National Skills Fund which are above 360 guided learning hours and you get a higher uplift of 650 for those. 
Um, so do be aware of those category codes as well, but check your category codes and make sure your MIS managers are aware of the category codes. And if you get some weird stuff coming up in your ILR, check the category code before you come to us with any queries, because it may well be it's the category code that's causing your ILR issues and other than anything that we are doing or anything to do with the individual qualification. So that's just to be aware of with those CAT codes. So um, with regards to adult skills, because there are so many changes and because we are have to, having to make changes as an awarding organisation um, and restructure some of our qualifications and upgrade them and update them to make sure they're up to speed, we're basically running a whole load of other webinars for particular sector subject areas. So that's just a list of all the ones that you can see there that are happening during July to support you with specific sector focuses and talking about the various changes we might have made to qualifications, potentially what funding stream they might be in. Um, or any changes that might be coming up so if you're delivering in any of those areas and you want to know what's going on please register now for those particular webinars because they'll bring you up to speed with what's happening so restart right so quick overview of restart for those of you that may not be aware restart is a new program it was announced in the 2020 spending review um, and then it was procured or the um, the commissioning process the commercial process for it happened early on this year it's actually managed by the Department of Work and Pensions. It's not managed by the ESFA, but ESFA adult education budget providers may well be supporting this, or you can support it if you're not already aware of it, um, and use your adult education budget to deliver some of the skills requirements for those participants in the scheme. So it's a three year long program. You can see there 2.9 billion managed by the Department of Work and Pensions, um, and it's for universal credit claimants who are 18 and over but it's not just about skills and as you can see from the graphic I've put in on the right hand side there as well as the skills support to get people ready and into employment it's also offering support um, in other areas such as mental health housing and debt addiction as well as the employability and skills aspect of it and it's it can provide a wraparound provision of three of up to 365 days so that's a full year support that um, participants will get um, if it's needed. However, just for you to be aware, um, the on-program and um, outcome payments for this particular um, program are quite tough for the prime providers who are managing it. They only get 30% of the on-program, um, the, the sort of individual claimant amount, and 70% of it is, is, is given after the outcome. So the outcome is actually getting an individual into a job um, that's sustainable, so a sustainable job, so six months or more. Um, and they don't get that payment until that, that person has been in, that claimant or participant has been in a job for at least six months. So that's quite a challenge for prime providers. Um, inevitably, that means it's going to push some, some, some behaviours in terms of trying to get, you know, participants and claimants into work as fast as possible, um, which may be a challenge for, for, you know, for providers when it comes to um, skill support. But just to be aware that obviously if a participant is referred to skill support as part of the research start program and you are working with a prime or you want to work with a prime and offer them the use of your adult education budget for participants on restart um, there's no reason why the restart participant shouldn't continue with whatever provision you're offering by the adult education budget even if they are pushed in they are um, the the restart results in a job outcome for them and they they move into that job and they're no longer on the restart program they can still continue to gain those skills achieve a qualification or achieve whatever program it is you've got them on um, um, to help them stay in work and progress um, their career and, and, and their, their employability options as part of that. So if you're using your adult education budget or you want to use your adult education budget for restart, um, they could, those, those participants can continue on with the course even if they're no longer on restart because obviously AEB is a separate program and a separate offer from restart, although it can be used to support restart. Um, so Job Centre Plus are managing Restart and they'll be making the referrals to the prime providers um, and the prime providers then, um, these are all the prime providers, so you can see there who they are. Um, I'm not going to go through that list, but you can see that there's 12 contract pack package areas over there on the left hand side. In the middle you can see where those contract package area coverage, coverage is or where the and then on the right hand side, you'll see the prime providers and um, the estimated starts on pro on um, participant starts on program and then the amount of funding that the prime provider has got. And basically within eight weeks of referral by Job Centre Plus, the participant um, has a, a face to face meeting with the prime provider and the JCP work coach. 
um, and then they do a diagnostic assessment and they produce a smart action plan and that smart action plan can cover all aspects of the support that the participant needs so as I mentioned earlier it can be drugs and alcohol support it could be um, how mental health and uh, mental health it could be housing but it also it is skills and employability requirements um, to get them ready to get them into a job to so that the prime providers can achieve the outcome payment and prime providers are working with a whole variety of different subcontractors as well as skills um, providers and, and you know, there may be skills providers that are subcontractors and there may be skills providers that are working as partners with those prime providers and the prime providers are referring participants to you for skill support using your adult, your adult education budget funds. Um, so the smart action plan basically gives a sort of target action plan which is, which is um, managed regularly by the prime provider um, and part of that may be your e AEB. Now as I said earlier AEB is not part of Restart um, but participants can be referred to and they can continue on because AEB funded learning doesn't have to be completed within the year, it can continue after the restart program ends. So that's just to be aware of that the, the AEB is not linked to restart in that way. Um, so you can use it and, and keep on using it with those restart participants. There's some challenge there about um, eligibility, but if they're already on a program, I believe that they can finish that program even if so. That's restart. And just to show you the adult education budget funding grid, I've updated this slightly. The ESFA have produced a new one. It's much longer and they basically go through it line by line. But I've stuck to this grid and just changed the level three um, to add in the new adult level three national skills fund offer there in the middle that you can see. But as you can see, they're 24 plus unemployed are pretty much fully funded for everything. Apart from if they already have a level three, in which case they'd have to access a loan to do another level three, um, which we know is a challenge because loan, loan funded level three has never really taken off. There's only really sort of between 20 and 30,000 loan funded qualifications delivered each year. So it's, it's a lot smaller than it should be. I'm hoping that the new skills bill government loan system will be something much more attractive to learners to encourage more people to, to change and upgrade their level three learning if they already have one. Um, so that's just a grid to help you. I'm not going to go through it in massive detail, but just to show that those 24 plus unemployed are, um, and also 24 plus other, um, are fully funded for English and Maths and Essential Digital Skills. Uh, and also, if, um, if it's a, f that, that's just the other thing to note, the first full level three. Um, there are some learners out there that have got level three qualifications, but they're not necessarily a first full level three. Now, the first full level three is the equivalent of two, um, two AS levels, uh, sorry, um, two A levels, I think it's four AS levels or a, a three, at least a 360 guided learning hour certificate or diploma at level three. So if they haven't got one of those, then they are still actually entitled to a first full level three. So even if they've got a level three qualification, if it's just something like an award or a, you know, a very small qualification, they can still access the National Skills Fund to gain their first full level three. So just check what type of qual or award it is that your learners got if they're coming to you interested in the in the National Skills Fund. Um, if they're obviously if they've got a first full level three, they're not eligible. They'd have to go for a loan. But if they have full level three, they can still access it. So there are still some learners out there that have got level threes that may be eligible for the National Skills Fund or for their um, legal entitlement to full level three. So just double check that when you're talking to learners and make sure your staff and your um, students admissions guys are aware of that as well. So um, we are um, um, supporting Restart in a whole variety of ways with various products and, and, and services. So, and we are talking to some of the primes about um, our products and services. So um, if you want to know more about Restart um, or if you want to get in touch with some of the primes and you'd like to know how to do that, we have um, a Restart Lead Business Support Manager, Joe Bell. Those are his contact details there that on the left, as you can see. And we've also got a Restart website that we've set up and we'll be adding more information to that about products and services that we'll be offering in support of Restart. So, um, and we've also got other sector webinars with Restart going on in June and July as well. So keep keep an eye on that particular new web page on our site um, if you're interested in Restart and supporting it in some shape or form and want to know more. Traineeships. Okay, so um, we have a new traineeship site. The reason I've flagged traineeships, and I know we've talked about this before, but there's an awful lot going on with traineeships. First thing you need to know is that the current traineeship flexibilities that were put in place to support trainees um, 
pandemic have been extended into, into next year. So that means that the £1,000 employer um, benefit is still available next year. Um, and the other flexibilities, which I'll go through in a minute, are also being extended into next year. There's no further news on the 16 to 19 traineeship commercial process. Um, obviously, CF, um, FE colleges have their 16 to 19 allocation and they can choose to deliver traineeships with that as part of the study programme arrangements. But for private providers, um, there are very few, if any, private providers who have access to 16 to 19 provision. And because Rishi Sunak and the Treasury and the government wanted um, to ensure that 16 to 19 year olds had access to um, traineeships, um, there was uh, there was a discussion about there being a procurement process, a commercial process for independent training providers to access the 16 to 19 funding for traineeships. Um, that was meant to have occurred last year. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting. Nothing has happened yet. The ESFA say it is on the cards. It's pretty damn late, it has to be said, because they're certainly not going to be ready for um, a commercial process to be ready for the beginning of next year for independent training providers to deliver 16 to 19 traineeships, which is frustrating because, you know, we know there are FE colleges across the country, but it's not always easy for learners to access some of those FE colleges. So the coverage for 16 to 19 traineeships at the moment is very patchy. Um, and it would be really great if we had good cover across, coverage across the country because traineeships are a great stepping stone for 16 to 19 learners into an apprenticeship if they're not yet ready. For example, the business admin level two apprenticeship framework was removed last July. There are many young people who are not ready to step onto the level three and a level two sector traineeship in business admin is a perfect stepping stone to get them ready to step into a level three apprenticeship standard um, for business admin. So that is not available right across the country because of that patchiness of delivery. So let's cross our fingers and hope to God that, you know, something comes up soon with a commercial process and a procurement for 16 to 19 traineeships by TPs, because that really does need to be in place because of that patchiness. So I'm hoping that that's going to happen soon. Um, there's been lots of talk from the ESFA about sector based traineeships, and they've been doing a lot of webinars about it. Um, and there was there was discussions at the AELP conference um, a couple of weeks ago about this. And Peter Mucklow was asked about traineeships and, and what he thought the direction of travel was. Um, and he said something very interesting, which was that he can see, sorry about that, he can see that going forward in the future with the reforms that are occurring, the level three and below qualification reforms. Um, and let's just talk very quickly about those. Those level three qualification reforms, the direction of travel for level three and below qualification reform direction of travel is that unless a qualification maps to a standard or maps to the occupational map, profession route through to an apprenticeship standard or to T levels and those occupational maps, it's more than likely that in the next two to three years, those qualifications will lose their funding. And what Peter Mucklow said is he can very much see that traineeships will become the level two progression route to, to apprenticeships um, standards and to T levels linked to those qualification reforms. So if you're not delivering traineeships yet, um, particularly for 16 to 19, that is something to really seriously consider going forward. Because if you do deliver a lot of level two provision, it's going to be in the next two to three years, potentially we're going to see big changes in that area. And traineeships may well become one of those key areas and key programs which acts as, as the progression to an apprenticeship for young people. So if you don't deliver that or you've not been considering delivering, it's definitely something to consider delivering now, um, and particularly if that commercial process comes up. Because with those qualification reforms, you could see what you're able to deliver severely restricted and reduced going forward. No, it's not going to happen next year and it's probably not going to happen the year after. But certainly the year after that, I think we will see some 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 serious changes and some quite sweeping changes to the level three and below qualification offer. And that's obviously going to affect what you can deliver and the amount of funding you can access. All of that is linked to IFATE's work on occupational maps and standards. So that's another area to watch on the IFATE website, because obviously they are responsible for um, um, for, for um, employer standards and for occupational maps. Um, so watching that work, and we're watching it very carefully in terms of, you know, any qualification changes that we might make and any updates we might make to our qualifications and any new qualifications we might be considering um, developing. Everything we do now is linked to those occupational, stand, uh, occupational maps and, and the employer standards. So that's just something to be aware of. So 
So here are the flexibilities for traineeships, just a quick run over. So the, the parts in red are the bits that have changed um, in the last year or so that are being um, those flexibilities that are being um, um, pushed forward into next academic year. So previously for trainees, they had to be level two or below, but now they can be qualified up to level three. Um, so if you've got a learner that's a level three, but you think they need a traineeship because they're either moving into another sector and the level three they've got doesn't really isn't really getting them into employment or not doing what they, they need um, in terms of their career. So if they've already got a level three, they can still access um, a traineeship if they're 16 to 24. Um, the duration has still been extended to one year. It used to be six weeks to six months, but it's now six weeks to one year. So within that one year, you can now fit a full qualification. So, for example, what I mentioned earlier about the business admin and the fact there's no apprenticeship framework at level two for business admin anymore, and there's certainly no standard um, as yet, whether there will be is questionable. Um, it was a definite no from IFATE last year, but there's been rumblings about the potential for something else. Um, but at the moment, it's not there. So you can actually deliver a full business admin level two qualification during that one year um, traineeship. Um, and you draw down the extra funding for delivery of that qualification as well. Um, so referrals still coming, um, but obviously um, it's still that sort of joint stronger working with Job Centre Plus and careers advisors for referrals to traineeships. Um, you've got the vocational offer, that's the um, flexible um, part of the traineeship, which is 70 to 240 hours. Um, of vocational qualifications that you can slot into a traineeship, plus the English maths and now the digital. Um, now, in respect of digital, um, some of our IT qualifications will drop off funding at the end of July. Um, we are working on our essential digital skills qualification because that seems to be the digital, digital um, qualification that the ESFA is willing to fund as part of traineeships. So we are hoping that they will be ready for or, or certainly available in the new year. Um, our EDSQs have gone to off qual, so we're just waiting for feedback on those. Um, and then obviously you've got... Um, the um, work placement as well. So the increased um, learning aim cost, that's the um, core part of the traineeship, is still £1,500. It was increased from, I think, 975 last year. So that core part is still the £1,500. Um, and then there's still that employer incentive for £1,000 for a maximum of 10 trainees per employer that's going is going to be available next year as well. And just as a quick overview, the funding um, for the for those examples. So you can see there the 19 plus funding on the left. Um, so you've got 1500 core element. You've got if you were going to deliver English and maths because they were needed, you've got the functional skills there. You've also got the EDSQ funding. I should have slotted that in, but I've missed it out there. Don't quite know where I've managed that. And then, of course, you've got the optional vocational element, which I've put there, that example of a level two um, certificate in principles of business administration, which you would also get the extra funding for. So your potential funding for a traineeship there is 3672. Plus, if you're delivering EDSQs because they're needed, that would be another bit of funding on top of that 3672. And then the 19 plus 16 to 19 um, funding on the right hand side, that's the normal um, study program funding arrangement that um, has always been in place and dependent on how many hours you're delivering as part of that traineeship would depend on how many uh, how much funding you would get so that's the funding example for traineeships apprenticeships um, apprenticeship funding rules have not yet been published um, they are expected by the beginning of July well that's this week so hopefully they'll be out this week or next week um, there's I don't think there's going to be massive changes, but there are going to be changes made to what is and isn't eligible for funding from the levy, because the ESFA is reviewing the eligible and ineligible costs for apprenticeships in terms of what the levy can and cannot be spent on. So when they do eventually come out, watch out for that. If there's any major changes, I will run a short webinar to flag them. So watch out on our um, social media pages, because if I think it's needed, then I'll run a webinar on those funding rules. That um, those changes to what is and isn't eligible for funding um, is linked to the Institute funding ban model. Now, many of you will know if you're delivering apprenticeships that um, the Institute has been reviewing how they attach a funding band to an apprenticeship when they set it up and the standard first becomes available. Um, and the link there you can see is to that consultation that they've been doing on, on funding bands and how they how they make decisions on the funding band and how they eventually allocate it and allocate the band to the individual standard. Um, but they can't actually publish the full outcome of that because it's also linked to the eligible and ineligible costs um, review that the ESFA is carrying out. 
So expect some changes um, for that if, uh, you know, over the next six to eight weeks. It may well be that it has to be signed off by ministers, in which case it probably won't happen um, before the summer break. Um, so we're looking at early next academic year. Um, once the ESFA publish their, publish their funding rules with the new ineligible and eligible costs review um, content, then IFATE will then um, obviously publish their funding band model review outcome. Um, interestingly, um, I've heard that um, the IFATE, uh, IFATE was um, looking at a variety of different ways with, um, to, to manage sort of funding band allocation. And they've gone for the more, it looks like they're going for, towards the more variable offer, which is a much better outcome for us because I think that the previous one didn't take account of the extra ineligible and eligible costs that the ESFA was taking into consideration as part of um, you know, levy review. So that's a good thing, um, and, but we, we can't really say much more about that until it's all published. Um, and just to be aware, for those of you that are on the webinar who deliver the higher levels, um, the Senior um, Leadership Apprenticeship, the Level 7, I fear it removed the MBA at the request of the Secretary of State um, for, after a review. Um, it's now a non-mandatory qualification. So what that means is that it does you, you can't not it doesn't mean that you can't include an MBA um, in in the senior um, leadership apprenticeship, the level seven. Um, but if you do, or if the employer wants the MBA include MBA included, or the apprentice wants the MBA included. Um, they would have to pay for it. So they have to pay for the registration and the certification. But any aspect of the MPA that maps to the standard can be paid for the levy. So it's, as I said there, I've used the opposite there, haven't I? So registration, certification, and any aspect of the MPA that doesn't map to the standard cannot be paid for the levy. But if the MBA does map to the standard or parts of it map to the standard, then you can use the levy to deliver that. But it's mainly the registration and certification and, and those aspects that don't map that can't be paid for by the levy. And just a bit of noise about the Baker Clause. Now, this is the clause for schools that says that they must make sure that the careers advice they give is fair and unbiased and includes all opportunities for young people to make a fair and unbiased decision about the route they want to take. We know, and I'm sure that you know, most of the FE sector knows, that that has not been applied fairly and in an unbiased way by a lot of schools across the country. So the government is looking to toughen that up um, and looking at potential formal action for non-compliance, which I think is a fabulous thing, considering I spoke to, to quite a few young apprentices who said that they got absolutely no information about apprenticeships at school. And one young lady who I met about 18 months ago who said that her teacher had told her if she took an apprenticeship, because she had um, three A-levels and she was <coughs> heading for um, an apprenticeship, that's the route she wanted to take. And her teacher told her that if she took an apprenticeship, she would be ruining her life. I can't see that as fair and unbiased um, careers advice. So um, the government is looking to tough that up and there's been noise about the potential for Ofsted um, to um, potentially give a requires improvement inspection grading if there is non-compliance with the Baker Clause and fair and unbiased careers advice is not given. And that's obviously not in writing yet, but the fact that the government is looking at this and wants to toughen it up, I think that requires improvement would be a fantastic idea because that would really enforce that need for the Baker Clause in schools to be given, um, to give them fair and unbiased advice to young people, which is what should be happening. So that's another one to watch as well, because that could increase the numbers accessing apprenticeships later on. And final slide, subcontracting. OK, so the ESFA have published their new funding rules for subcontracting for 2021-22. And that link down there in the bottom right hand side in the yellow circle um, is the link to the main page on all the subcontracting information, including those new funding rules for 2021-22. Now, I'm only giving an overview here of these rules. Um, and as we all know, we should know, is ESFA are not banning subcontracting. What they want to see is subcontracting that's done well and for good reasons and that is properly overseen in terms of quality and, um, and probity um, and, um, and that it adds value and it's not just subcontracting done for the sake of subcontracting or to use up a particular funding stream because the provider in question has not been able to spend it all that year. So I've said that the subcontracting rules 21, 22 have not yet been published. That's because this slide is a couple of days old and actually they have been published in the last few days. So ignore that second red line that's now out of date. Um, but the rationale that's been given, um, this is just a very quick overview of those subcontracting rules, is that you as, an, as a provider um, or um, providers must have a clear rationale and strategy for subcontracting that is published 
in place by the start of the academic year and you must publish it by the 31st of October. It's got to be signed off by your board and governance group. So they've got to have agreed your subcontracting strategy. Um, and there are actually pro formas and information for um, board and governance groups on that page, um, on that link um, about how to monitor um, subcontracting strategies um, to make sure that they are fit for purpose and that there is a clear rationale. Um, you've also got to publish your full range of funding retained and the charges that you um, you um, place on your subcontractors. The ESS, as you can see there, the ESFA expectation is that it will be a maximum of 20% um, of the funding as, as your charge. But if you do um, charge more than 20%, you will have to explain to the ESFA in a written rationale why that is and have very good reason why you are charging more than 20%. And they have to give you permission to charge more than 20% if you are. So do not expect to be able to charge 25% because the ESFA is going to be contacting you to say, what's your rationale? We need it in writing and we may actually say, no, you can't do that. So do be prepared for that. Um, if you're subcontracting more than 100k, you have to provide an independent audit report as to that provision and why. Um, and also, um, if you are, if your subcontracting isn't fulfilling one of those four rationales that you can see there in the bottom, um, in the arrowed um, bullet points, then you also have to produce. Um, um, you need to reduce your subcontracting provision under those circumstances. So that's a very quick overview of the subcontracting requirements. There are a lot of documents attached to subcontracting now with the subcontracting reforms. So do go onto that link and have a look. Um, make sure that you've downloaded all the forms. Um, if you've never subcontracted before, you cannot just start subcontracting. You have to write to the ESFA and ask for um, permission to subcontract. You have to give the rationale as to why you are subcontracting and they have to give you written permission to subcontract. You can't just go ahead and do it now as and when you want. Also, um, if you are, um, um, you have to take consideration of the procurement rules. Um, so if you're subcontracting over a certain amount, you have to go out to procurement for it. You can't just subcontract without doing so. Um, and again, you'd have to have very clear rationale for that subcontracting if you're um, subcontracting over a certain amount. Um, so be aware of those click on that link, take a good look at your subcontracting arrangements, make sure that you are adhering with the new rules and regulations. Um, and if you're not and your provision isn't following those four rationale, then you're gonna need to reduce it over the next two or three years, um, whilst the ESFA is slowly reducing down. They're not doing it in one fell swoop because they don't want to um, you know, upset the market too much. And there are also smaller providers out there that fulfill niche provision um, very effectively and they don't want to affect that. Uh, but they are making it more difficult and they are making sure that subcontracting is happening for good reasons. So there are quite a few hoops for you to go th to jump through to make sure that your provision is, is, is what they want and what should be in place. Personally, I think this is a good thing um, because we know that some subcontracting provision before was literally just carried out to use up funding so that the provided, so providers didn't lose their funding at the year end. Um, but subcontracting should really be to, to, to in, you know, widen the opportunity for young people. Um, provide niche provision that you as providers that haven't got the expertise or, or ability to be able to deliver. Um, and also, you know, that geographical access for learners that can't potentially reach you as a provider, but can actually reach a small provider in their local area who can deliver, um, which obviously helps disadvantaged groups um, as well. So that's the subcontracting arrangements. Um, make sure that you're up to speed with them and aware of them. Um, I have thought about doing a subcontracting workshop and I may well put one together um, uh, um, in, in the next few weeks for delivery over the summer before the beginning of the new year. Um, it, a lot depends on timing with all the other work that's going on with regards to tags and also obviously the, the funding directory and the legal entitlement um, data that we need to be able to, to, to produce our directory or for me to be able to produce our directory. So um, just some information about how to get hold of us. Um, we've got Adult Skills and Inquiry line now because there's so many inquiries coming in about Adult Skills and the various different programmes under Adult Skills that we felt we needed a proper um, direct, direct um, like inquiry line for Adult Skills. And we've also got one for our digital learning inquiries, um, which supports Adult Skills where needed. Um, and that's just our keep in touch. Um, so the various web pages again. So the Adult Skills web page um, are the funding preference. That's my um, um, 
um, email update which I send out um, funding um, alerts for if there's specific information that you need to be aware of and also about our webinars. Um, that's the link there to sign up for um, email updates on funding um, and various other bits and pieces of keeping in touch. I will be sending out this deck and a recording to everybody that registered for this webinar um, in the next 48 hours. So do not worry, you will get the slides and you will get the webinar recording because it has been recorded. So thank you. That's it. Um, I did say it was going to be a longish webinar, I think. So we've got some questions here. I'm just going to pop out the questions and see. Um, Okay, so what questions have we got? Ooh, not too many, which is good. Oh, right, so I've got a question here about subcontracting. I did think that that might be the case. Um, oh, hang on a moment. Um, will the slides be sent? Yes, I think I've answered that question. So yes, yes, we are recording it and the slides will be sent. Um, any adult skills webinars for hospitality? Um, oh, Bev, I'm sure there will be. I mean, I've shown the ones that are there, but each of our sectors is being covered. Um, so I'll double check that. Keep an eye on our social media um, and I'll double check with our hospitality sector team. And it may be something we can send out a link to when we send out the slides and the recording of this webinar um, to you as well. Um, is there anything specific in the restart scheme budgets regard, regarding our digital ICT skills? Um, there isn't anything specific there, um, but as you can use the adult education budget to deliver digital ICT skills, um, then yes, obviously there's nothing specific because Restart is a, DWT, a DWP program. So DWP are very much looking at skills as one part of it, but within the, within the skills aspect of it and the employer aspect of it, if an individual needs IT, digital IT, ICT skills, which I'm sure many of them will, then those prime providers will be looking to skills providers to deliver some of those digital skills um, and ICT skills that may be needed. So, um, you know, look to contact the prime provider for your for your um, contract package area and if you are delivering those have a conversation with with the restart lead in that prime provider which you can get from from Joe in most cases um, about what you can offer them in terms of digital and ICT skills so yes it's nothing specific but it's definitely going to be a need um, Next, I'm assuming AEB courses delivered would be a way centre could draw down some extra funding whilst on program within restart um, this may bolster the 30%. Um, well, no, okay, so I understand that. So yes, um, so a, the adult education budget is separate from the restart program. So prime providers that are delivering restart are not necessarily, and in a lot of cases are not skills providers. They are restart providers funded by DWP for the restart program. So the outcome payment for that 30% goes to the prime provider. Um, and the AEB won't make any difference because the adult education budget is only drawn down by the skills providers. Please make sure that you separate out restart providers from AEB providers because they are two separate types of provider. AEB is drawn down by skills and training providers. Restart is drawn down by DWP prime providers who are providing um, health, mental health, housing and debt, addiction plus the overarching restart program smart plan for each individual um, so it won't make any difference to that 30 percent that the restart um, prime provider will get for the on program uh, on program but AEB does um, obviously um, add to the funding that can be used to support participants in restart it doesn't come out of that 30 percent um, that the prime provider gets on program it is in addition to um, because it's providing extra skills and extra input to restart so yes it does bolster it i see what you're saying rob um, but it, it is a separate funding stream um, we're a private training provider and we're offering 16 to 19 traineeships um, it's the 19 plus we can't deliver. Ah, do we find out if we have an AEB allocation? Yes. Yes, Jane, you're one of the very few that may have 16 to 19 funding you can use for traineeships, but there aren't many of you. Um, so, yes. Oh, yeah. Let's hope that the AEB um, outcomes are known very, very soon. As, as I said, ESFA did say by July. I think it's July on tomorrow, Friday. <laughs> so hopefully 20 next 24, next 48 hours, you should get some news. I really hope so for your um, your um, sake. Will the sides pack be sent out? Yes, it will. Um, 
with the subcontracting update, is the funding retained and charges needed per subcontractor if we have more than one or as a whole? Ah, right. So if you've got more than one subcontractor, which we know many of you have, um, it's 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 100k aggregate per subcontractor. Um, and also the funding retained and charges has to be per subcontractor. So it may well be that you know, you're charging one subcontractor 18% and you're charging another subcontractor 20% because you're doing more for them. We know that some subcontractors may do their own ILR um, or may have their own you know, sort of uh, 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 various programs and um, arrangements for quality, et cetera, and you wouldn't need to do that for them. And there are some subcontractors that don't. Um, so it is on a per subcontractor basis that you need to, um, it particularly, obviously if you're charging the same across the board, then you could state that in your rationale to the ESFA that you publish. But if there are different rates um, and you are charging one subcontractor more than the 20%, that's the rationale you would need to explain to the ESFA. So I hope that's clear. Um, also, with the point relating to subcontracting of more than 100k of provision, is this as a whole or per subcontractor? That's per subcontractor as well. Um, does subcontracting apprenticeship provision adversely affect a provider's AEB budget? No, um, your subcontracting apprenticeship provision is separate from your AEB, but you still have to have the rationale and the subcontracting arrangements um, and, and costs in place for each, each um, funding stream. Um, so it doesn't adversely affect your AEB budget because that's treated separately um, from your apprenticeship budget, but you, your rationale and your costs for each funding stream, whether that's AEB, um, traineeships or um, um, apprenticeships, it, it still has to run across them and you've still got to have costs for every single funding stream in there. Um, we run an Ofsted registered tuition centre from five, age five to 16. Oh, hang on a moment. Um, hang on. Oh, that's. Where to start for funded adult education programs? We are based in a deprived community and basic English and math skills will be very beneficial for the locals. Ah, right. Um, well, I'm, I'm afraid that as um, a tuition centre for age five to 16, you've sort of missed the boat, I'm afraid there. Um, the adult education budget um, was procured, um, the commercial process for that took place early on this year. There will not be another one for three years. So the only way you can actually deliver to 16 plus um, is if you either have adult education budget, um, access to 16 to 19 provision, which is handled by um, the Secretary of State and local authorities, um, and is a very long process to go through, um, and is generally really most of the sort of um, um, 16 to 19 goes to FE colleges with a few private providers and it's not generally procured for there's an application process so um, unfortunately no the best thing you can do there if you do have um, 16 year olds is to refer them to a provider that does have access to that that funding because it's not something that can be delivered um, you can't use that funding the 16 plus funding to deliver to five to 16 year olds you should be using your five to 16 year old funding to deliver maths and English um, and there will be other providers in your locale that will be delivering 16 to 19 maths and English. You can refer your learners to them. Um, oh, a new private training centre. Please, can you advise how to apply for adult education budget or ESF funding? Um, we can't really um, advise on that. With the AEB, as I said earlier, it's already been procured for. There will not be another procurement for AEB for a few years, probably two to three, because I think the, the current contracts are for three years. Um, and to get on to the only other thing that you could deliver would be the apprenticeships and you have to um, do the ROTAP, the Register of Apprenticeship Training Providers application process. And at the moment, the ROTAP process is only open for providers that are delivering in core priority areas. And those are COVID priority areas. Um, so if you look, um, if you put Register of Apprenticeship Training Providers into your search engine, it will bring up the application um, um, page, web page, and you can have a look at that and read that in some detail. And it will tell you how you might be able to apply for um, apply to deliver apprenticeships with local employers. But there's a very comprehensive application process for this and you have to make sure that you adhere to all the application requirements to achieve that and with regards to subcontracting um, we can't really advise on that beyond you'd need to approach local providers that have access to ESFA funding that might be willing to subcontract with you but obviously it's got to be under those four um, um, areas that I flagged earlier on um, as being um, the rationale for subcontracting. So filling niche provision or um, 
providing you know provision in an area that's not got a lot of provision available because it's outlying or whatever I think that's all the questions and we've slightly run over so apologies to everybody for the slight run over of um, questions as I said the slides will be coming out with the recording um, in the next 48 hours because we have to wait for the recording to download and we want to send it out all together but you will get copies of all of this um, very very soon so thank you everybody thank you for joining me I hope that was helpful um, Great, thanks, Dawn. That's very kind of you. I'm always glad when these when I get feedback telling me whether these um, whether these are informative and helpful. The next funding update webinar will be in early September. It'll be the first one of the next year's three. Um, and um, look out for us on social media. We'll be advertising that, and I'll send it out also via the funding update alerts as well. Great, everybody. Great to have you on online today. Thanks very much, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>